I'm out in the desert. It's the calm before the uh, skank fest storm where I gather my thoughts. I'm one with the earth. I flip over random rocks, see if I can find a rattlesnake to bite me. That's the next program I'm getting into, rattlesnake expert. Uh, slash heroin needle finder. You can do both those things. You come out to the desert, you flip over random rocks in this day and age, you might find heroin needles from the pre-fentanyl times, or you might run into a rattlesnake. You don't know, that's adventurous. Other people, they like to kayak and uh, go on bike rides, but if you really want to live wild out in the desert, you flip over random rocks. Also, for all you Texas people that were giving me shit when I was saying Texas is not that good looking, I mean, take a look at this and tell me that this isn't, you got anything like this in Texas? Have you ever seen a mountain like this in Texas? Listen, I'm not a, I don't know much about the Mormon religion. And uh, from what I understand, Joseph Smith ended up in Utah because he got chased out of every state after he had sex with all the 14 year olds. Um, but if you were gonna show up to any random part of the world and just declare it God's territory based off of physical beauty, I think you, Utah might take it. I mean, I haven't seen everything. I haven't been everywhere. I've mostly just traveled the United States of America, driven on roads and realized it's nothing but the exact same uh, strip mall in every single area, except the strip malls are getting worse. Can we talk about that? It used to be the entire convenience of a strip mall was that you could just pull into a strip mall park right outside the store that you were gonna purchase something in and then you can move on with your life. But now they started like, have I already talked about this on Run Your Mouth? I don't remember. They got basically the rope system that they used to have outside of clubs. So if you showed up to a club, they would pretend like it's all important. You gotta wait in this line. You can't even get into the club. And so they started putting up all these stop signs and these like little jigsaw Tetris pattern things so you can't just pull up to the store. So even strip malls, which suck, they made it worse, but you come out to Utah, it's nothing but beautiful open roads and rocks that you can flip over to see if there's uh, rattlesnakes or heroin needles. Anyways, you got a double episode of Run Your Mouth coming at you. We did a live one from uh, Detroit, so that's coming up. But you know, there's a couple news stories that I wanted to highlight, because uh, other than the live episode I'm gonna do with Sam Tripoli, I don't know what else I got planned for Skankfest. But before we get into today's news topics, Porchtour.com, uh, last opportunity to some see a bunch of this material before I burn it. I'm adding a New York City date. I'm adding a New Haven date. We've got Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, we got Massachusetts back at the Shell. Denver, where I will be taping. Please come out for that one. Uh, Arizona, Chicago, and I think that's all of them. But if you go to Porchtour.com, you'll see all the dates right there. Anyways, let's get into a couple of scattered news topics and then it's the live episode from Denver. But porchstore.com, buy the tickets. Do I gotta plug it again? I'll waste 10 more minutes on this plug. If I gotta if I gotta keep plugging in order for you to actually go there, support the tour and buy the tickets and then come out, I'll keep saying it, porchstore.com. All right, anyways, back to the news I was trying to tell you about. Firstly, roll this clip. I mean not yet. Roll it in a second. But this is this clip gave me hope. I thought firstly, it's still every time Biden turns up, I'm surprised he's still alive. Every time he pops up, you're like, wow, they're still gonna roll this guy out. So he's given two speeches recently. And in this one, this one's fun. We thought Biden was done. We thought that uh, we rode the dementia train to the end. We never got to see a big ass flame out, but now it looks like he's uh, finally gonna start cutting loose. We might see the real Joe Biden roll the tape. I thought when I got to be president, I get to do things that I wanted to do, but my staff tells me what I can't do, <laughs> but I'm gonna do it anyway. All the young women, young kids out there that are, are out there, come on up and do this for me. Stand behind me when we do this. Come on. And the guys. Come on. Which I get it. You suck the devil's dick in order to become president. You finally get there, you've got dementia, and then everywhere they roll, they keep rolling you around and they tell you you gotta behave yourself, but you only got three months left to be president. And what do you got left to do? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta let your kid off, uh, Hunter, off the hook. You gotta give that guy a pardon. But other than that, you wanna start having a good time. You already got to, you, two months from now, you're not gonna have access to the best chocolate chip ice cream in the entire world. And if you hire yourself a chef, you're probably gonna have to drown him out in the ocean. I mean, you like following the Obamas, and that's what you gotta do with your chef. They start seeing all the kids that you're uh, sleeping with, they start seeing how big Michael Obama's cock is, and you gotta drown them in the ocean. So you're at the last three months of getting to be president. You don't know how much uh, time you're gonna be able to eat the good ice cream, and now they're not gonna let you sniff kids anymore? You're, you can't go out without sniffing the kids. That's not what you became president for. You finally get to be president. You don't quite have the mental capacity to do the job. You don't quite have the knees and legs that you did to go up and down 
the, the, onto the plane and fly to the other countries. And now you're in the last couple months and you know what? You go, I'm done listening to my aides. I probably only got six months left to live. I've only got three months left to be president. You're not telling me I can't sniff the kids anymore. So this is fun. I wonder what unhinged Biden's gonna do when he goes, you listen, you already recalled me uh, and it's over. The, the ride is over. This thing's over. They, they arrested Puff Daddy. This thing is over. Don't tell me I can't some have, have a little bit of fun in my last couple months of presidency. Then he also got up in front of the UN, you know, one last pitch to end the malarkey. And I got a question for you about these presidents because I thought that's what it was gonna be. Hey, we need to have a more peaceful globe. I said I was gonna end the malarkey. There's more malarkey now than ever. I don't want to be a failure of a president, but instead he's up there and he's still pitching the Ukraine war. He's still pitching that we got to be supporting Israel. They got to have the peace fire, but we also got to keep sending them bombs. It's just, uh, and why do these people care about their legacy? Why is it that they have to rape us in our buttholes and then go, hey, did you like that? I mean, you liked it when I raped you though, right? Remember when I spent all that money, I brought all the people over the border here, I caused the inflation and I got you guys into wars that you didn't want to be in. Hey, remember when uh, we were kind of getting along with Russia and then I decided to start a war with them so you guys would all have to wonder whether or not we'd end up in World War III and getting nuked to death while I continue to escalate and say we had no choice because while we're being aggressive, this is just trying to stop the aggression that's in the world? Aggression, extremism, chaos, and cynicism. A desire to retreat from the world and go it alone. Our task, our test is to make sure that the forces holding us together are stronger than those who are pulling us apart. That the principles of partnership that we came here each year to uphold can withstand the challenges. That the center holds once again. My fellow leaders, I truly believe we're at another inflection point in world history. But the choices we make today will determine our future for decades to come. Will we stand behind the principles that unite us? Will we stand firm against aggression? Will we, will we end the conflicts that are raging today? Will we take on global challenges like climate change, hunger, and disease? Will we plan now for the opportunities and risk of a revolutionary new technologies? I want to talk today about each of these decisions and the actions, in my view, we must take. To start, each of us in this body has made a commitment to the principles of the UN Charter to stand up against aggression. When Russia invaded Ukraine, we could have stood by and merely protested. But Vice President Harris and I understood that that was an assault on everything this institution is supposed to stand for. And so, in my direction, America stepped into the breach, providing massive security and economic and humanitarian assistance. Our NATO allies and partners in 50-plus nations stood up as well. But most importantly, the Ukrainian people stood up. I ask the people of this chamber to stand up for them. You know that you're out there. You became president. You did all the evil stuff. You ran all the money that you needed to run. You, you got to do all the stuff. Why do you have to then turn around and continue to try and sell it on us so that you can feel good about having done it? Can't you just rape us and then move on and go, wow, look at what I got away with? Why do you have to then, you know, sell it to us even more? Like, hey, you guys enjoyed that though, right? That was a good time. All right, and now we've got RFK Jr. He's out there now and he's talking about, I I'm gonna make you guys all healthy. You guys wanna have abs like me and still, and still be getting DMs from 24 year old women. I know how many 30 year olds are in cells and you can't, you can't get laid anywhere. And, and you're just spending the, the little bit of inflation money you have left just to keep, see a couple of titties on OnlyFans but I, I can get you abs. This should have been his in campaign the entire time. The, hey, they're turning you into fat fucks, but I can make you sexy like me. He should have, while you had those two old men out there when Biden was still in the race, and you've got Trump all orange, obsessed with his fast food. And you know, if Trump moves around a fair amount for, uh, for a fat guy, but you could have just had RFK Jr. up there going, I, I can tan so much better than Trump. Look at how much more tan I am. 
How great would that have been? Just, uh, you know, nothing but RFK Jr. He should have gone like Instagram model campaign where he could have been out there telling us how you can slice the heads off of goats. He could have taken us out on his hunting adventures. He could have taken us out on his ski trips. He could have done his entire thing as a modern fitness influencer with just Instagram posts of him doing TRT or whatever else he's doing so that he can still look. Or maybe, maybe he, well, we know the Israel stuff. Maybe he's the most Epstein of all of these people. But he's got a winning pitch right now of being the only guy out there going, hey, listen, you're all a bunch of fat, unhealthy fucks, and I'm here, and I can help you out. That would have been a winning campaign. Everyone wants to look better. You go talk to the best-looking people. I bet even Brad Pitt sometimes just looks in the mirror and he questions if his ab lines aren't a deep enough ab line, and if two years ago those were deeper ab lines, and if he's losing it. I think I, I've hung out with like even dudes that are like anorexic skinny and they think they're fat. Nobody thinks they look good. There's a little tip for you, no matter how, by the way, the only people that think they look good are actually the completely delusional um, fat fucks who for some reason think they're skinny. You get a couple of those. You get some Cartman-esque dudes who are complete fat fucks that for some reason think they still look real good. And then sometimes you see that in women too, but they know that they're kidding themselves. They know it. That's why they're, that's why they, it's a put on of aggressiveness. But for the rest of us who are uh, pretty much straight in the mediocre lane, you know, just know that the people who look way better than you, they don't think they look good too. It, it, no one does. And then everyone's, everyone's chasing it. And, but those people, maybe it's almost a gift that they still think that they look bad, which is what allows them to put that much work into it, which what you really need to do is go, who really cares? I like cookies. I like, and, and, just, and just cut loose and enjoy yourself. But anyways, what I was trying to say is that RFK Jr. has a winning pitch here and that everybody would like to look better. And so here he is with the pitch of, I, I can make it look good. You know, every 33-year-olds, the they're still trying to have sex with me as a 76-year-old man. I can teach you how to do it. All right, let's roll that clip. And then we're going to go right into the live run your mouth. The first uh, intro part is from Salt Lake City. And then the rest of it's from the uh, show in Detroit. Come out to porchtour.com because we got a bunch of good stuff coming your way. And then, of course, thanks to YoKratom.com, home of the $60 kilo for making this all possible, and SheathUnderwear.com for the greatest underwear that's ever graced the balls of man. Roll the tape, and then the other episode. As everyone knows, once a drug is approved for Medicare, it goes to Medicaid. And there is a push to recommend Ozempic for Americans as young as six over a condition, obesity, that is completely preventable and barely even existed 100 years ago. Since 74% of Americans are obese, the cost of all of them, if they take their Ozempic prescriptions, will be $3 trillion a year. This is a drug that has made Novo Nordisk the biggest company in Europe. It's a Danish company, but the Danish government does not recommend it. It recommends a change in diet to treat obesity and exercise. Virtually Novo Nordisk's entire value is based upon its projections of what Ozempic is going to sell to Americans. For half the price of Ozempic, we could purchase regeneratively raised organic agriculture, or, 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 organic food for every American, three meals a day, and gym membership for every obese American. Why are members of Congress doing the bidding of this Danish company instead of standing up for American farmers and children? think it's true follow your heart and your dreams follow your heart and your dreams Protect your soul, follow your heart and your dreams. Well, follow your heart and your dreams. Woo.
hospital. He couldn't even walk, but now he's walking down this hall. Follow your heart. You think it's true, follow your heart and your dreams. Follow your heart and your dreams. First up, in light of Puff Daddy's arrest, America's be Americans begin to question if rap is gay. <laughs> Next up, we explore the government technology that's cloning and replacing missing Ohio cats. <laughs> and with reproductive rights on the ballot, voters ask, which party will take a stand against old people having sex? <laughs> and quit putting our youth at risk for STDs, with other voters stating an urgent need for Washington to put an end to the growing trend for breast reductions with Republicans saying they'll vote to legalize abortions if we'll leave the big tits out of it. <laughs> saying my body, my choice has gone too far. With other, other men saying that big tits only look good in bras and that they've been suckered by larger women where they were hoping to suck on fat nipples thinking it would taste like pink Himalayan salt only to discover it's more like trash juice. <laughs> All that and more on today's Run Your Mouth. All right, let's get into our first news topic of today, which is uh, how gay is hip hop actually? Uh, with my prediction being every rap star going country now. <laughs> I think you're gonna see every single rap star going, nah, I'm a real American, I do fucking country. I don't do that fucking gay rap shit. I think they're all gay. I think every one of them. Have you guys seen the video of Tupac when they were interviewing him in high school? Have you guys not seen this? You got it. All right. When you go home tonight, you got to watch the video of Tupac where he's like, I just feel like I could be a star. I'm most like my mom because I'm arrogant. Totally arrogant. I agree. I have to say it. Like at work, I, I can't hold a job. I, I just quit my job today, actually, because I wanted to come and do this. And they wouldn't let me. And I felt like it was important. And it was more important than serving pizza. And we had enough people. So. I felt like since I'm an actor, they should understand. They should have let me do it, but they didn't. And then I had a cold, so they were making me work in a freezer. And I'm, I'm really not one to be disrespected, and I felt like that was disrespectful because I asked to go, you know. So I quit, and he told me I couldn't quit. And that even made me hyper. I'm arrogant, so when he told me I couldn't quit and we had all these customers, I chose that time to jump on a soapbox, grab my leather jacket, light a cigarette in front of him, smoke, and leave in the middle of a rush. So that was natural. That's arrogance at the top. That's what I think I'm most like my mother. And she likes it. She'll see it in me and know it. And then you're like, at what point in time did the CIA or someone else pick you up and turn you into this fake gangster rapper? Like, they're just actors, all of them. Um, I would like to see the Honest Puff Diddy song with all the rapper vado, but it's throwing a party where uh, you're gonna rape this guy. <laughs> all right. Now, hot take. How how long do you think he's gonna be alive for? How long do we think until he gets Epstein? What do you got? You guys, are you giving it two minutes? Do you think three weeks? Do you think they at least kill him in a different way? Like. Can they really just turn off the cameras again? Can they get away with that twice of, oh, the cameras were out and the security guards were taking a nap. Like, all right, and now, okay. shower death. what was that? Like, you think they'll fuck him to death? <laughs> I, like, I like how you added that part. Like it could have, 
it could have been a slip and fall in the shower. You know what I mean? It could have just been a good old fashioned, hey, I was a little clumsy. I wasn't used to how slippery it is in a prison shower, but you took two that they were gonna sodomize him to death. <laughs> I'd say as the American public, we should like, I, I mean, the guy's fucking in jail. He lost his rights anyways. Let's broadcast that cell. I want 24 seven. We've got the technology for it. Let's keep him alive until, did you guys see there was this really creepy video where he had a child on his lap and he starts just reading off the list of people he's inviting to his party, which was kind of like a wink wink, like, hey, you guys, you guys have all been to my parties. I'll fucking squeal. I'll fucking squeal. All right, so my first theory, when I, like at first when I saw it, was uh, that's gonna give me a fucking, uh, what do they call it, a seizure. I'm gonna, yeah, it, is there anything gayer than having a seizure <laughs> while you're trying to do your own show? All right, so, uh, at first, I was thinking, listen, your Puff Daddy, I, I, I don't know a single Puff Daddy song. I don't, he's not really relevant to my cultural experience. Like I said, I'm a rock and rock and roll roller through and through. And guess what? That's fucking gay too. But uh, I'm not familiar with Puff Daddy's body of work. Now, Puff Daddy, I assume, you kind of go through the Hollywood system. And uh, I think you realize, oh, it's fucking easy as fuck to blackmail people. I think you must realize that other people are playing that game and realize how easy it is. You bring people to your house for a party, you tape them doing crazy shit after you get them on drugs, and now it's like running one of those internet chains where it's like, you'll be cursed and you'll wake up without an asshole unless you send this to your five relatives. You guys remember that? You would read some creepy story and then the person with the claw came in the middle of the night and that's gonna happen to you unless you send this to seven of your best friends. You guys remember those stupid chain letters you would get when like the early internet days? So this is like that where like you tell someone, you get the footage and you're like, listen, all you have to do is you gotta come to my next party, right? You get some, you get some celebrity, I don't know, name a celebrity, doesn't matter. Oprah, you get Oprah to show up to your party, right? You get some young twink to fuck out Oprah. <laughs> Pretend like it doesn't smell, right? You get, you get that footage, then you threaten Oprah. You're like, listen, you gotta show up to all my parties, otherwise I'm putting that footage out. And now all Oprah's gotta do is show up to the party. And now you get to go to the next celebrity. Hey, I've got Oprah and all these other people showing up to my party. And you know, you just keep bringing in more and more people. You start, anyone here ever do GHP or whatever that fucking drug is? No, neither have I. We're all normal people, but I would like to see that, that jury defense where it's like, Your Honor, I don't think the jury can weigh in on this until they've taken GHP and experienced how horny they are. You know, it's like, this is not a jury of my peers. They have yet to experience this. Um, so at first, I was like, I bet that he just realized that this is the way the game is played and he was making big old fat checks of money. But then I went down a bit of a, uh, a wormhole a little bit, I'm gonna do more research on this, but the conspiracy theory that essentially the CIA propped up R&B music to basically sucker the black community into being kind of pro-crime, pro this deviant lifestyle, and ruin those communities. I don't know, you guys think that that could be true? Yeah. Based on what you've seen? All right, so now along the lines of where, like you, you just start to kind of think of it, it's crazy. And I gotta dig into like, the, the, these are some of like the fascinating storylines where sometimes you confirm things. Like it used to be, I guess the Fed didn't just print money as recklessly as it did now. So when Reagan wanted to run operations down in South America, they had to actually, while drugs are illegal here, run the illegal drug trade and they'll put people in jail for it, but they need those profits that they can actually do their missions. That's crazy if you think about it. The fact that the president is putting people in jail, saying that drugs are bad, the war on drugs, and at the same time, the CIA is actually running the drug operations because they need that money in order to do things off the books. That's crazy to think about. Here's another thing that's crazy to think about. I remember once reading, and this gives so much insight into the way that like government manipulates us, is, uh, um, it, Jackson Pollock, you guys have all seen Jackson Pollock paintings. I guess they're cool. I don't know, is that good art, is it bad art? I don't fucking know. If I see one, I'm like, this is pretty cool. But what the government was doing during the Cold War was they were spending a fuck ton of money buying Jackson Pollock paintings so that they could pretend like, look, the market for fine art is in America. Like we are, we are dictating world culture right now that you know where people care about artists, it's in America. And how were they doing it? They were just spending a fuck ton of money on it so that it was prestigious. 
And that's kind of like, the, we, we do all kind of make value things around people's status. And so if government artificially, let's say, steps into the market and buys, I don't know, let's say I published a book tomorrow, we can call it Rob's Rectum, all right? Doesn't fucking matter what's in this book. It's just dribble for my stand-up things that I never put into my act. If all of a sudden the government were to turn around and buy every copy of this book so that it was a bestseller, guess what? All of a sudden, I'm a New York Times bestseller. I can go anywhere in the world and go, look, this is the number one published author. This guy made $10 million off a book. He sold more books than anybody else. And it's all fictional. It's just that government stepped into the market and they created an artificial prestige as if I'm an important person because they put money into it. So they, they've done that before. We know that governments did it. They did it during the Cold War with Jackson Pollock. And if you really want to break down what the whole fucking ESG racket is, or even the way that the news networks work now with the Boeing money and everything else is it's all artificial status and prestige, which comes from government money. So we know that they can do this, right? So especially if you think back at the way that markets worked back in the 90s, where basically what, there's five, six hit radio channels in every single network, and there's one guy that makes some determination about what gets played on those networks. So the idea that like the government could see, hey, there's these artists called, let's say, NWA, and they're putting out this music, and maybe nobody ever would have experienced it, nobody have ever would have seen it, but for some reason, people were like, you know what? I actually like this in the urban community. I wanna increase this signal. And there's a lot of life which is just kinda like, to what extent do you have an increased signal? So like, I, I've saw, I talked about this before. Guys, I've been doing comedy 13 years, and this is a thrill that I can show up to the middle of nowhere and that you 30 people will come hang out with me. That fucking rules. Totally agree. Yes. I mean, I, I, I built this, like, this is brick and mortar. This is as direct as it gets. I, I'm lucky that I have a friend, Dave Smith, who has a bigger podcast. And, and, and he's lucky that he was in the comedy world long enough to get a Rogan. And all of that is a broadcast signal, right? But sometimes I look at furry conventions. <laughs> and the autistic people that seem to be into adults dressed as furries, and you realize, oh, if you get your shit up in front of enough people, there's some amount of people that will like it, right? Like you could take my comedy hour that I did tonight in a different world, you could have put it on Comedy Central, HBO, and I don't know, let's say uh, 100,000 people tune in, and maybe, maybe I have bad numbers and 10% like it, right? And so I walk away with 10,000 fans. That's still 10,000 people that didn't know about me previously. Right? Think about any band that you hear on the radio. Firstly, most bands, how many hit songs do they have? And how many people, like, think of Foreigner. I don't like Foreigner. I know who they are, though. Right? I can't, what, what's that one Foreigner song? Name a Foreigner song. You guys know, or name, name a different shit rock band. Def Leppard. I fuck, there's not a single Def Leppard song that I like. But they got radio airtime, so they have fans. So I'm just saying the idea that the CIA or someone else couldn't step into the market broadcast a signal very loudly. It's kind of the same way that they manipulate news information. It's the Goebbels thing. You can take something that's wrong, you amplify it loud enough, you repeat it enough times, and all of a sudden, the people think, hey, vaccines are uh, safe and effective. I've been hearing this, safe and effective, safe and effective, right? So you broadcast on the airwaves, you take something, like, okay. Anyways, this is what I'm getting at. I, that's the ADD, I know, I know, okay. I don't know to what extent the CIA had an involvement in propping up rap music, and if they did that in truth to undermine uh, the black community and to have these people obsessed with crime or you know whatever other negative influence could come from rap. Sure. Any, any pushback on that? I mean, you're, you're telling us out yeah. here in Byron, Michigan, out in the, beyond the suburbs. Any pushback on that? This assertion you're making. From you guys, no, not at all. No, I mean, oh. in your act across the country, has anybody like pushed back and said, I mean, this oh, is, you're crazy, that's not true? This is my first no, time was, delving in or bringing up this specific topic, so I can't say whether or not there's pushback. But like, even, like yeah. might be authentic. And right. Some people might say, you're wrong, it's authentic, it's the real deal, right. it's us. Right. You're not hearing that so far? Well, this is my first time okay. saying it, and it's yeah. a room full of white people, so <laughs> okay. there's no one to say, nah, man, that was my shit. All right, anyway, sometimes I think about this, which is like, where do you get your values from, and how much of it is just kind of downstream from what you were influenced from in pop culture, and who actually instilled that? Like, who came up with those things that you start making values around? So like, for example, I'm, I'm somewhat lucky, I'm no longer uh, religious, but I grew up like Orthodox Jewish. So to the extent that I really kept that as a lifestyle, 
even so, I grew up with things like rock and roll, which I guess there was some church lady at some point telling you that ACDC or whatever was the devil. I grew up on American Pie and all of these movies. I watched plenty of porn in high school because we weren't getting laid, so that's what we did, right? Showed up to yeshiva, but well, we're not gonna jerk off, like that's ridiculous. Even, even God understands that, but the point I'm trying to make, I have a little bit of a window into uh, being removed from like kind of a constant mainstream American culture to have different values. And so it is just interesting to me the extent by which organizations such as the CIA could make decisions of, hey, here's a value that we want to instill in people. Let's spend a lot of money. Let's get talented actors and let's make it cool. And the extent by which people can really just be indoctrinated by, you know, just downstream, just they broadcast the information at you loudly enough, they convince you that it's cool, and then you spend your entire life with artificial values that was just instilled in you, you know? It's, and then if you start thinking about like, which I haven't really delved into, but like the frequency of music, like I thought that was actually kind of interesting in the Lego movie. Remember that when they're all like, everything is awesome, whatever the fuck that song was. But then you think about it, you get these people that like, you're listening to your radio, you listen to your top 40 hit song, and then you go to a bar and it's the same shit. And by, I don't know about you guys, like if you don't, like I, I listen to it at home, I listen to like jazz, jam, blues, rock and roll. But like literally the frequency of that shit, when you're like stuck in a place and they're just blasting at you and you kind of feel uncomfortable. Like have you ever been in a club and you feel like you need Coke? It's because of the horse shit that they're blasting at you. It's the energy of that shit where you're uncomfortable and you're like, oh, I got to pacify myself. And then you just start thinking about kind of like the indoctrination, even on like the more subliminal levels of the way that, all right, the last thing on this, then we'll move on. There's this, uh, are any guys jam band fans at all? Yeah, jam band fans? No? All right. Uh, well, you guys, uh, you guys should get into it. There's this guy, Colonel Bruce Hampton. He's a personal favorite of mine. He uh, actually had the biggest flop in American, uh, um, in Atlantic City Records history. Greg Allman at one point, they were giving him a deal, and he was like, I will only do a record with you guys if you guys also do Bruce Hampton's record. And he put out an album called Music to Eat, which was the biggest commercial flop in Atlantic City Records history. But he had a philosophy of music that it's like, uh, that it's like food. And that like, I, and I, I kind of see it in my life that what's broadcasted at us is such junk food that I think it does influence decision making. All right, back to P. Diddy and his clandestine operation, right? All right, so my first theory is I think he was just kind of looking at gaming the system and it was a way to make money. But then I started kind of delving into this rabbit hole. But now the thing with the CIA or even government organizations, it's hard, like I don't think anyone at the CIA ever sat down and recruited Puff Daddy. I don't think that's the way it works. Because I think that like government likes the plausible deniability. And so like even when like, for instance, they were pushing crack, they would still arrest you for selling crack. There's no one, there's no one from the CIA ever sh showed up on behalf of some street crack dealer and went, no, we're trying to sell crack out here and this is our distribution channel. What they go is, oh, let's le they let you tie your own rope. Like, it, you know what I mean? If there's an illegal activity and it benefits them, they'll let you go do that Ill illegal activity for as long as it benefits them. They're not gonna empower you, they might look the other way. So I bet like on a, on, on a Puff Daddy thing, if they were interested in the rap music, they would empower it. If they noticed that they had an amortal individual, maybe along the lines they kind of train the guy on, guy on here's how you blackmail, but it's not like someone from the CIA, it's someone else from the music industry being like, hey, you wanna know how you get yourself a liquor brand? You wanna know how you get yourself a this? You gotta throw a party, you gotta do this. And, they're like, and then they just kind of let you go at it until you run into trouble. Um, it, okay, now what's wild about these parties is just the amount of celebrities that were clearly all in it. And then you just gotta wonder how roped in is everybody? How much did everyone know? How much will the media delve in? Will people start to squeal? And then you got the creepy part. Who are these people? Should we know these people here? Oh, the last ones? No, I don't know any of them other than Leonardo DiCaprio, but I mean, tell me Leonardo DiCaprio didn't get his ass banged out that night, you know? <laughs> And then you just have to think two things. First is, you know, you would think if there was one thing that men weren't better at, it was getting raped for jobs. But apparently we're putting up numbers there too, you know? Like, like I, I think, you know, for all that Me Too thing, did any of you guys think that was also happening with dudes? You know, I, like that's, that's crazy to think of that Justin Bieber's got his career now because they, I mean, like that's fucking, I mean, it's, it's gross to think about, but it's great. And then, all right, here's the other thing. 
that kind of blew my mind. And that, like, as a dude, sometimes you're like, you know what? It's lucky that like I never had the opportunity because I could see your GHP at a party, and then you wake up in a video the next morning. And you're like, fuck, shit. I knew I shouldn't go to that P Diddy party, but you know what I discovered? You might have just gotten raped, okay? Like, like in your head, you think like you're the rapist until you find out there was also the option of just being the raped. All right, moving on. Uh, my other thought was just like, you wonder why these celebrities are all so dark and drug addicts, and it could be that they all were, you know, kind of, kind of went through this to get to where they are. Like, you ever watch these celebrities and you're like, why are, why are you so damaged? Like, you're living what seems to be the best fucking life, but I guess none of us have any idea of what kind of a deal with the devil they all had to make to get there. Uh, all right, let's get into the Oprah episode with Kamala Harris. How many guys watch this? None of you. All right, good for you. You guys all have lives to live. You didn't miss out on much. You did not miss out on much. It was not television for us. I will say... Oprah Winfrey knows how to do television. Like for any conservative out there that's telling you, oh, Kamala Harris, even she looked bad. Oh, even Oprah was bored. Even Oprah, they're all lying to you. I watched it. It wasn't interesting to me. What Kamala Harris has to say is all nonsense and baloney. It's like, by the way, it, it, everything now is, we're not going back. What Americans feel in their hearts is how we have, and it's like, no, what we'd like to is not have inflation, not have wars, not have people and feeling like we're secure and like our kids can live better lives. And don't talk down to me and tell me that I'm just not being optimistic because I have my eyes open to the fact that you're ruining the country. But their thing is, their propaganda is, oh, you're just being pessimistic. What Americans like is just being nice to each other. So I can see through that line, so it's irritating to me, because this, oh, we're just, we're about being nice. And that's why we're gonna spend more money that we don't have. And we're gonna give you the $50,000 that you can afford a home. You're not giving me $50,000 because I can afford a home. You're indebting me more to the system where you're putting me into a house which will now have a higher price tag so I can pay off more of a debt to a bank for my entire life. That's what you're doing. You wanna get money out of the system, home prices will start coming down. So it's all, I can see through it. To me, it's horseshit where she gets to go, we're just gonna be nicer people. That's the lie. The other guys, they're meanie pants. They're a bunch of meanie pants. They're so negative. They're telling you the country's not, but what Americans care about is that we can all be nice to each other. So I can watch that and go, hey, this is a bunch of bullshit. I wanna turn it off. But as far as they're selling it, it's excellent television. And so here was the great party trick that uh, Oprah Winfrey pulled. I'll tell you guys how propaganda works, is that for the first five minutes, she's got A-lister after A-lister celebrity pledging her allegiance to Kamala Harris. I guess all of these people were at the Puff Daddy parties. Chris Rock must have been at the Puff Daddy party. Chris Rock starts it off, I'd like to see a woman black president pledge allegiance. I'm here for Kamala. Next up, Ben Stiller, I'm just here for Kamala. Then they've got uh, uh, um, Julia Roberts, I'm just here to support Kamala. So right off, the, right off the bat, they're telling you, hey, the most important people, they all, they're all supporting her. And then every once in a while, they just flash to her, like Meryl Streep doesn't know how to act and pretend like she's interested in something. Like I'm supposed to be impressed that Meryl Streep is putting on a face that she's impressed with Kamala Harris. She's a fucking great actor, right? But that's the propaganda show, is you take the elite of our culture to go look at, they're all pledging allegiance to her. The smartest, the brightest, the, the, you know, the most fortunate, the gods amongst us, the celebrities, they all support her. And then, you know, they give her the softball questions. And so for anyone telling you otherwise, I'm disappointed with the Kamala Harris campaign thus far because I've seen her be ridiculously stupid and I haven't seen that yet. And it's bothering me, all right? It's bothering me. Where is the Kamala Harris laughing about buses? That's the Kamala Harris I want to watch, right? Yeah, where's the one? The moment in time, because if you understand how time works, it's a second later than when I just said that. And in another second, another moment just passed. But if we could have all these moments together, and you're like, what acid are you fucking on, lady? That's the Kamala Harris I want to watch. But instead, and this is fun, you know, because for a while they were telling us that she's the candidate of joy, right? That's why she laughs so much, it's the candidate of joy. But now I see her and she just seems like, I don't know, she almost seems depressed. Here, give it a listen. If it. We love Mark. There we go. I love. 
I know we all do. That's why everybody's here right now. We love our country. We, we take pride. We love our country. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I hear when this. I know we all do. That's why everybody's here right now. We love our country. What I hear is some nurse ratchet. Mother loves you. Mother's here for you. Is that not the tonality? Mother, we, we love you. We're going to spend all your money and be in wars, but it's because we care about you. That's what we do. All right. Uh, we'll see how many of the... I don't have too many clips to play, so if they're not playing that well... Um, all right. The other one that I wanted to highlight was uh, Kamala Harris basically talking about that she wants to do a 50000 tax deduction uh, for people that are starting new businesses. I guess if you're starting a new business, the current tax deduction or tax credit is 5,000 and they wanna change it to 50,000. And when I heard that, I was like, great, you now, you, you just created a new tax scam where everyone can pretend like they're like, which is fine, I'm all for not paying taxes, but how do PPE loans work out? You really think you're gonna create something, like most businesses fail, so what incentive would you have to not claim that you're starting some new Etsy business called uh, the, the cats on my lawn. I don't even fucking know. You can draw cats and go, I'm selling these on Etsy now. And then whatever your income is, you can deduct the $50,000. So listen, by the way, for any of you Republicans out here, if you want to know who's going to reduce your taxes the most, it's Kamala Harris who just came up with the dumbest tax scam of all time, where anyone who wants to create their own new business can make a $50,000 deduction. All right. This was from the Wall Street Journal. Hey, any of you guys read the Wall Street Journal? I read the Wall Street Journal every day, all right? Just because it's like the driest form of just mainstream media, so you can kind of just see, it, it, it's straight and narrow. Sometimes in the opinion section, you get shit that's a little bit more pro news, but I'm saying if you just want a meat and potatoes flavor for like straight news talk, Wall Street Journal is a good resource. The day after the debate, Swift didn't plan with Harris campaign. Why do I have to hear about Taylor Swift at all? And this is in mainstream fucking meat and potatoes, stockbroker, I want to read the news newspaper. I have to hear about Taylor Swift. Kamala Harris also, the first question in an interview that she did with, uh, here, we can see if we can play it. Kamala Harris, Taylor Swift. I am very proud to have the support of Taylor Swift. She's an incredible artist. I really respect the courage that she has had in her career to stand up for what she believes is right. But we were on different sides of the Super Bowl last year. <laughs> 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 but who's mad at anyone for being loyal to their team, right? So there you go. How is this the country that I live in? We're having a presidential election. You finally get a hold of the presidential candidate. You finally get a moment where they can express their views and opinions, and we're having a conversation about the Taylor Swift endorsement. Who the fuck cares? How is this news and politics? This is the world that we live in. All right, the one thing that makes me feel a little bit good about this is um, Hamilton. Any of you guys ever go into New York City and see Hamilton? No? Okay, Hamilton was sold out forever. Like $500 a ticket, you could not go see Hamilton. First part about Hamilton that's interesting, by the way, I'm a dumbass when it comes to American history, but I'm pretty sure Hamilton's responsible for the Federal Reserve. All right, how is that the person that we're gonna celebrate? It's an entire play basically celebrating that the banking industry managed to take over our government and create a federal bank that could give them free endless money and basically make the monetary system of them having endless access to just being able to print free money. That's what the fucking Federal Reserve is. And okay, and it's not just that, it's like slam poetry that you would have laughed at your gay friends in high school for doing, where it's like bad, like, all right, listen, for as gay as like Tupac and Puff Daddy is, when you see a bunch of white kids just like rhyming to like a Broadway beat, you're like, yes, this is way fucking gayer, okay? I'm just saying, like, if you have to rank, like, the gayness of rap, when you put it next to the white, hokey, like, just drumbeat rhyming bullshit, right? Then, then at least the, the hip-hop thing, you're like, all right, this isn't quite as gay. All right, so anyways, 
this brought me inspiration because here's the cast of Hamilton, which I don't understand how it's like one of the most successful plays of all time, but here's them, uh, you know, amping up Kamala Harris. Let's see if it plays. Hopefully it does. Give it a sec. Gotta give it a sec. Bad internet. I think you, you guys might have already got the point. Even the internet's sick of it, you know? <laughs> Even the internet's like, fuck this shit. All right. Here. You say the law is destructive, I say it's reproductive. So let my message be instructive. We want each time our rights were gambled and we're picking reps who will persist. And if you believe it's not the truth, the internet is here, I'm so prejudiced. Look it up, look it up, took your step. This is the best that they have to offer, okay? So I just want to say it. I might be paying for 20 people in a fucking shed, but I'm right and they're wrong, okay? You fucking lame fucks, okay? I just want to say, like, this is what I'm talking about, just signals being broadcasted, that they are somehow able to make this popular. You want it, like, who, who thinks that this is cool? I want to know every single person that went to Hamilton and was impressed with this. Yeah, you guys aren't as livid as I am. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> Did someone just say it's good music? I will put you into that fire out there, okay? I will offer you as a sacrifice. I, oh, I don't know, we'd have to look that one up. All right, this is a rich, this is a rich story. US says Iran emailed stolen Trump campaign material to Biden camp. So apparently, as reported by Reuters, uh, Iran hacked the Trump campaign and then sent files to Biden that was received by people in the Biden campaign and read. Okay? Fuck your Russia collusion story. Do you remember what the beginning of Crossfire Hurricane was? Was they tried to trick the Trump organization into taking files that were supposedly from, uh, from Russia, right? And then based off of that, they investigated Donald Trump for four years and said that he was a Russian asset. And then it turned out, I think the Hillary Clinton or it was uh, Obama had put in that together. Well, it was Hillary, right? It was Hillary Clinton. There you go. Yeah, Hillary made the Steele dossier. I don't want to fucking hear that story ever again. This is the exact, like they actually did it. In the Trump instance, they didn't take it. And by the way, Russia's not, I mean, at this point, because we've changed circumstances uh, with the Ukraine war, I guess you could say they're as much of an enemy country as Iran is. I mean, the whole thing's ridiculous, but I'm just saying from an American uh, political perspective, Iran is a more noteworthy enemy than Russia. So the fact that they hacked your opponent and sent you the information, just by comparison to what they did to Trump over the Russia story, that one's got to be over. All right, uh, quick recap of some other big stories in the news the last couple of days. One is, I want to take back my comments from the last Run Your Mouth. Um, where I had given up props to the Israeli government for the pager attack. It had seemed to me, no, I was, I was mistaken. It had seemed to me that they had done a target attack that very specifically only harmed Hezbollah. Uh, this is odd because even in the days after the attack, the way it's being reported, um, this is Wall Street Journal, Nazra upon its retribution for the intelligence operation, which caused pagers and walkie-talkies carried by thousands of militant group members to explode, killing 37, injuring nearly 3,000. Now, it doesn't say civilians, and it's grouped together in the same sentence as, uh, as they say, the militant group members, and at least when it comes to the Gaza situation, they're pretty quick to tell you when civilians are being killed. So the reporting was odd to me, and on the same note, even the New York Times, which has been fine with criticizing Israel over what's been going on in Gaza, said more than 2,900 people were wounded. The breakdown between civilian combatants remained largely unclear. Um, I don't even understand why the media seems reluctant to report on whether or not it's civilians or uh, military personnel or Hezbollah, if the terrorist organization, uh, are, are being killed. I don't know, what, what's, what, what, like from the media that you guys have been seeing, do you think that it was just basically a all-out terrorist attack? and that they blew up pagers in public locations and just killed people indiscriminately? Yeah. Like, what, what are you guys absorbing? Is that, is that your takeaway thus far? Absolutely. Because if, I mean, if it's 2,900 civilians uh, killed, how many people were killed on 9-11? Was it 2,300 or 1,700? What's the number? I think... 
a little over 3,000. So it sounds, I mean, if you, if, I mean, I don't know, maybe you got a slight argument that the pagers were handed out to military personnel and so it wasn't quite as indiscriminate, but I, I don't know, if you killed 2,300 civilians in public locations, I don't know, that sounds like, that sounds like a terrorist attack to me. Yeah? I, I mean, I guess we'll see over the next couple of days on the way that it's reported, but I, I take back what I said on the last episode because the original news coverage, it seemed to me like it was uh, pretty specifically just targeting Hezbollah, in which case I was like, well, that's badass that you figured out how to get, you know, specifically soldiers. But it, 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 I guess in the later coverage, it doesn't appear to, to be that. All right. Uh, don't know if this video is going to play. Let's see. Once word was out, the border was far easier to cross. San Diego went to over 100 SIAs in 2022. Well over that in 2023, and even more than that, registered this year. And these are only the ones we caught. At the time, I was told I could not release any information on this increase in SIAs or mention any of the arrests. The administration was trying to convince the public there was no threat at the there you have a government whistleblower saying that in San Diego they were told not to report on terrorist arrests from people pouring in over the border. So firstly, all the border numbers have been a big fat lie. The fact that they've been using the pardon and the asylum system to bring as many people over as possible as they could and keep them out of detention facilities so that they wouldn't have pictures of kids in cages. We all know how fraudulent it was. It will be interesting if we actually turn the administration and the Trump administration is smart enough to highlight all these stories and get the good data out of what actually took place over the last four years. Um, but it's interesting that in the last couple months, firstly, over the last year, the storyline got bad enough that uh, they had to change the asylum laws and they had to try and fix it because going into an election season, it looked so bad they didn't have a choice. Now, even mainstream media is reporting on the fact that there seems to be large numbers of gangs that have poured in over the border. It's interesting, though, to see, I guess, the beginning of the wheel starting to change on the coverage of the story and whistleblowers coming forward to go, hey, there certainly are people that have come across. Uh, North Carolina governor race jolted by report the GOP nominee called himself a black Nazi. Uh, oh, yeah. I just feel like, can we keep the porn comments out of politics? You know, if, if, if you're taking the time to comment on, on a porn, I feel like that doesn't need to be news. <laughs> All right, um, and then here's the last one that I wanted to, uh, to uh, oh, no, this was, we'll make this the last story for today. Um, okay, here, play it and then I'll give the commentary. That's the history and legacy of white disregard for the humanity of black people. Oh, so now you're calling me racist. I didn't say, I didn't say that, that is for racist. Yes, that is no, complete You don't have to intend racism no, to No, 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 you are intending that I am Your disrespect of Kamala Harris is part and parcel of the previous disrespect. And if you just said, Congresswoman, what can you do? I'm not calling you a racist. I'm saying what the practice is. You are. You have to be the fairest way of saying it. Disrespect. Disrespect. Now, what's disgusting is your disrespect of her. Professor, this gentleman said, you know what? What's disgusting to women is her disrespect of women. She doesn't know what a woman is. And if, if 25 years ago, I don't have the ability to tell black women who. All right, so anyway, I forget what I forget what her name is. Do you guys remember? I think McKin McKin I forget her name. All right, anyways, I don't like what she did here, but in terms of just showcasing how WWF the news is and the extent by which people are just playing a role, right? So he's out there. I mean, it, it, it's no different than any WWF wrestler and whatever their shtick is, where they got to get up there and they got to sell a match. He's got to be up there calling her a racist. And she said Kamala's name wrong, and he's got a role to play, which is, hey, the news cameras are on, I'm going to call you a racist. And so after this exchange, and now I don't agree with what she did here. You know, let's not shame dudes who are trying to get laid. It's part of life. It's the way it goes, you know? I would like to also enter into the record a screenshot of a text message I received from the esteemed professor from Vanderbilt, Michael Eric Dyson, after my CNN interview. So he go she goes out there and shames him on the congressional floor and goes, Hey, I was being flirty towards him, and look at the messages he sent me. In this text, he says, after calling me uh, a 
racist on CNN. Shh, don't tell. Don't tell anyone we look good together. And then, you know, heart emoji, whatever. Listen, I, I don't, I, so listen, this is kind of a gross move. If you look at the exchanges, she's playing in a little bit. And then to go on the congressional floor and go, look, this guy was hitting on me in text, that, that's not cool. But if you ever wanted a more pure showcasing of how just full of shit the news is, and how WWF it is to be out there in front of the camera yelling racism, 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 how dare you're a disgusting human being, and then get off the television camera and go, hey, you wanna go out? <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? You know what you're, you're putting on a fucking TV show. That's all you're doing. You do not believe what you say. You've got a role to play, and you're like, hey, I can keep showing up. In my world, he's being the heel, right? But in their world, he's not, right? In, 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 in their world, he's the, uh, uh, what's the, what's the other term? Help me out here. What's the non heel in wrestling? What? Face. He's the face. To them, he's the face. She's the heel, right? She's going to get out there and say Kamala's name wrong so he can be out there and go, how dare you, dirty racist? But to me, it's funny in reverse where we can look at it and go, oh, that's the heel where you're just going to claim some shit you don't believe so you can keep perpetuating these, uh, these fake racial tensions. All right.